Tonight in our study, I'd like to begin, and we'll continue this in the next few Revelation messages, looking at the time of the second advent, looking at the time of the second advent. And our, our study is an offshoot, and I had promised you before that when we study Revelation, there will be many offshoots from the book. But this is an offshoot from the middle of the first verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his slaves things which must shortly come to pass. There are a whole lot of questions about the time of the second advent, the date of the second advent. You would think that no one, having read the New Testament, would ever attempt to set a day, but that has been done, well, countless times probably down through history, still being done today. People have various ways of getting around what appears to be rather obvious, that no man will know the day or the hour. But Jesus certainly does say that certain signs will precede his return. Now, we all are aware of that, but I trust that in our studies here, we will all uh, really be thinking deeply about some of these matters, some of these related questions. Because take, for instance, what I've just mentioned, the well-known fact, one uh, upon which I suppose we would all agree that there are some very obvious signs the Lord himself predicted would precede his return. Amen. Now, the question then would be, we already are settled on that and we're aware of some of those signs, famines and wars and earthquakes and pestilences and so forth. What is the time context of those signs? You say, well, they precede the second advent. By how much time? By how much time? Obviously, they precede. They don't follow. They precede the second advent. By how much time? Here's my question. I mean, here's what I'm after if you can't already discern this. You're going to have to think real carefully in all of this business because we all have, whether you have read the Bible correctly or read the Bible erroneously, we have certain views about the millennium, the tribulation period, uh, certain views about various rapture theories, the second advent of Christ, certain views about the day of the Lord. And those views are only correct if they'll square with all of the biblical revelation. You can go to certain passages and prove that there's going to be a rapture or there's going to be some type of something like that after the tribulation period. You can go to the Bible and prove that real easily. So we're not saying that that won't happen. But what we are asking is, is that all the Bible says? Is that the only time there's going to be a gathering together of the saints unto the Lord Jesus Christ? It will happen then, or at least a part of it will happen then. That's not a dispute. What the dispute is, is that all that's there, or do we have more? So unless your view fits all of the framework of Scripture, it's not a scriptural view then. Back to what I was saying, the signs. Are those tribulational signs or pre-tribulational signs? You'd give an answer of either A or B, right? And how would you prove that? How would you demonstrate that? Prove that, not so the skeptic would believe you, but prove it so that it's consistent with all of Scripture. Is this, uh, are these pre-tribulational signs or tribulational? Now, if you say tribulational, which seems to be what Jesus is giving, they ask for a sign of his return and of the end of the world. And whenever that's given, it's always cast in that last seven-year period and uh, especially in that last three and a half year period, that's a tribulational reference and those are tribulational signs, then what good does that answer really do us? Let's say that the second advent happened, would have happened back in the first century, back in the days of the apostles who asked that question. Then with your views here in this body uh, of the rapture, that there will be a group of people who go up prior to the tribulation, then what good would that have done the apostles then? You see what I'm saying? Now, if you say, well, that would have to mean then that, of course, it wouldn't have to mean anything. It would, just, it would have to mean that you'd have to rearrange part of your understanding of why those signs were given. It wouldn't have to mean this, but for some, they would say, well, that would have to mean that those must be pre-tribulational signs because why would it be given to the church if the church, the believing aspect, the part that's going to be reading and studying the Bible and believing what it says, won't even be here whenever those signs are fulfilled. Then we would either, we would say one of two things, then therefore what purpose would those signs serve or should we not just move those signs back to a pre-tribulational setting? So what we're going to be dealing with in the next few studies in Revelation are some messages concerning chronology of the last days. 
The chronology is very important. What you can understand from Scripture, and there's a lot there that can be understood, is very important. Of course, you'd have to start with the first big events, like, well, uh, the second advent. You know, is that going to be before the tribulation, or during it, or after, or before the millennium, or during it, or after? You say, oh, that stuff, that's real easy. It must not be too easy. There's a whole group of people out there today called post-millennialists who believe that Christ will return at the end of the millennium. Now, that's just an absurd theory. I mean, that's just totally absurd. What would even be the purpose of the return? And, and what's the millennium all about? It's certainly not the millennium as described in the Bible, except in some hyper-spiritualized fashion, which is what they do, the post-mill spiritualize. Everything Isaiah said about vegetation or animals or climatic changes, well, that's all spiritualized. All that's fulfilled in the church and so forth. Well, you would never have known that unless someone told you that. The rest of the Bible we take literally, and it's been fulfilled literally. Those prophetic signs which have been given and that have been fulfilled have been fulfilled literally. But there's a group of people out there, you see, that's confused on that one matter. Now, that's a basic matter that you already accept, that Christ's return precedes the millennium. Well, then move it back to the tribulation, precedes or follows. Then people are confused on that. Pre-trib rapture, mid-trib rapture, post-trib rapture. See, it's all a matter of chronology. You get the chronology down, and don't be afraid of, of getting the chronology down. I'm not saying, oh, I'm just saying this. Say, say whatever the Bible says. Stay with what the Bible says. And the Bible maybe has a lot more to say than some people realize as far as giving us the chronology. It's easy to say, well, the church is going to exist for so many years, and then the tribulation period is going to start, then Christ is going to return, then the millennium, then the final overthrow of the devil, and then the eternal state. Well, just about anybody, Post Mills and a few others accepted, can figure that out just from reading the Bible. But what about some more of these more particular questions? Amen. Like the one I just asked you concerning some of these signs of the Lord's return, tribulational or pre-tribulational signs. But these people who hold to the theory that Christ returns after the millennium hold to one of the most ab absurd theories that a person could imagine. Where do you get that? I mean, in Revelation 19, Christ returns to the earth on a white horse, right? And the next chapter, the millennium begins. I mean, it would just seem obvious that he returns prior to the millennium. So you've got to switch all of those chapters around and rearrange your whole thinking. That's a dumb theory, but a whole lot of people hold to that. Well, John says, what's going to get us into this whole area of discussing the chronology? It's very, very important to understand what we can, what the Bible reveals to us about this matter. And the more we believe that we're living in the last days, the more urgent the need is to understand the chronology and some of these things the Bible has to say. But what's going to get us into all of that? It's the middle of Revelation 1.1. Things which must shortly, things which must shortly come to pass. Well, I want to give you some of the interpretations of that phrase. You say, well, now, why would we even need to look at interpretations? Well, look at the verse yourself in the phrase. It should obviously present either a problem or a question to you. Knowing, it wouldn't have been to John. It's easy to predict something. It's another thing to watch and see if and when it's fulfilled. But living 1,900 years, almost after John said that, then the phrase either presents a question or a problem to you. Problem if you're a skeptic, a question if you're a Bible student. And it's a question you want the Bible to answer so you can go on and study other matters. So here are some of the answers to this. I mean, John said these are things that must shortly come to pass. In other words, I think people are going to try to do something with that term shortly there. We've got to understand that term. He said these things will shortly come to pass. They will shortly take place. Now for John, for his readers, no problem. If you're living a hundred years or longer after then, then you've got a situation to deal with. And we're living almost 1900, 1,900 years after that. That's a very long time period, very long period of time. For most of the episodes where God was dealing with, like his people in the Old Testament, were relatively short, then several hundred years at, at least, and often shorter than that. Babylonian captivity was not even a century. It was only 70 years. You think of how long they were in Egypt. Well, you know, 400, that's a pretty long time. And how long this lasted, how long that lasted. 
Why, you've got to go all the way from the call of Abraham to the birth of Christ to have enough time. That's the whole Old Testament era and period, dealing with the Jews anyway. You've got to go all the way through that before you equal what we're dealing with, this lapse in time between the first and the second advent. That's a remarkable fact in itself. So here are some of the interpretations. Well, from the last study, hopefully you can see that the easiest, fastest way to deal with the claim is just to accept the preterist interpretation of the book of Revelation. Right? That'd be the easiest and fastest way to deal with it. What's the preterist view? That all of the events in Revelation were fulfilled in John's day or shortly thereafter. Shortly thereafter, there I'm using that word shortly, which is ambiguous right now. That's what we're trying to clear up the clouds about. Well, let's say in the next two or three months or years, or even, even five or ten after John gave Revelation. That's the easiest way, and that is one of the backbones to the preterist theory, the preterist interpretation of the book of Revelation. John said these are things which must shortly come to pass, so John must have known what he was talking about, or he manifested himself to be a false prophet. And that would mean, well, in the Old Testament, execution. Here, you can't kill John, you just cast him off or cast his writings or his writing here off. That's the easiest way to deal with it. Say, well, the preterist interpretation must be the correct view. All of this must have been fulfilled in John's day. And so the beast is imperial Rome, and the false prophet is emperor worship, and we've already gone through all that stuff before. And it all saw its fulfillment there. Well, as I said with the preterist view, John in this book envisions worldwide catastrophes that take the life of huge portions, huge percentages of the earth's population. John evidently on just an easy reading, even a cursory reading, seems to me to to envision the complete overthrow of the kingdoms of this world and even of Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan himself. So much so that the kingdoms of this world are destroyed and those three individuals, those three persons, are thrown alive into the lake of fire. John seems to envision a time called the millennium. He seems to envision resurrections, bodily resurrections, are we to assume all that happened back in John's day? You see what happens with this preterist theory and preterist view? Even if you stop at chapter 19 and don't get into 20, 21, and 22, which obviously has never been fulfilled. Chapter 19, Christ is returning on a white horse with the armies of heaven behind him. When did that happen in John's day? Obviously it didn't. So... My response last time, and it will be here again now to the preterist interpretation, is simply this. Either John was grossly in error concerning his expectations. I mean, he envisioned this to happen, and according to this view, it's going to happen shortly. Either John was grossly in error about his view, or the preterist interpretation is grossly in error. You see, if John envisions those great things, then you're left with one of two alternatives. Either you find fault with John, or, of course, you just so hyper-super-spiritualize all of it that it has no meaning whatsoever to us or to them of that day. Or you find fault with the preterist interpretation. So a second theory is that the phrase should be translated like this, things which must soon or shortly begin to come to pass things which must soon or shortly begin to come to pass. With no comment as to how long they would continue or when they would conclude. Thus giving us the space of 1900 years, for us at least, and perhaps then some. Well, you might recognize this as the old historicist view, that after John gave it, this gives a, a picture of the gradual development and unfolding of history, basically of Western European history. There are problems with that theory as we've dealt with before, but one thing that comes to mind right now, since the historicist view generally does say, I guess pretty much always says, that Revelation gives a picture of the development of, let's don't even say Western Europe, let's be even broader for sake of argument, of European history. Well, what are you going to do with all those kings of the east coming from the other side of the Euphrates over in chapter 16 of this book? 
I mean, that's not dealing with European history at all. That's de dealing with Oriental history, with Far Eastern history. So that's another problem that the historicist view has, or another statistic here in the book of Revelation, which they conveniently overlook. The problem with this, with this view as we're studying it now is that there is no word here for begin. Archomai in the Greek, A-R-C-H-O-M-A-I, archomai. There is no word for begin here. This just says things which must shortly come to pass. It didn't say begin to come to pass like they could be set into motion, but we don't have to expect to have already seen the second advent of Christ, millennium and all that. That's still future from our point of view, chapters 19 through 22 must soon begin with no comment as to how long these events would continue or when they would find their fulfillment ultimately. Well, there is no word for begin here. John didn't say these things are going to begin to come to pass. He said, which must shortly come to pass. So you've got to read that into the passage, beginning so that you can have 1,900 years at least and perhaps then some of time during which these events can be fulfilled. So a third view all trying to deal with this one phrase, all trying to find out, now, when are the last days going to really be here? Then, somewhere between now and then, or now? So another view is that this phrase should be interpreted as follows, things which must certainly come to pass. Things which must certainly come to pass. Consequently, we don't have a statement on the chronology of the events, but on God's unchangeable determination in performing these events. They must certainly come to pass. This isn't happen chance. This isn't something that the whims and desires of the nations of the world is dependent upon. This is something that God said will certainly come to pass because he's determined that it be so. Notice that we take a, a time word out, the word shortly and put in like a, a fatal word or a predestination, predetermination type word. These are things which must certainly, just expressing the certainty of it all, not expressing any chronology like when it will happen, like shortly, just expressing the certainty of it all. Well, two problems with that theory. Number one, that's not what the word shortly means in Greek. Never has meant that, doesn't in any other place, doesn't here, never shall mean that. Shortly is is in the Greek, and we'll get to what that is here in a moment, is a time word. It's not a determination word. And so that's, that's an answer right there, but let me give you a second answer to why this theory is wrong. All these are theories that the commentators have dreamed up to try to deal with what John said, that these are things which must shortly come. The answer is real obvious and real simple. It seems like that you're kind of, uh, you have to buy into, you're forced into the preterist view in order to interpret the Bible literally. But you're not forced into that as we'll see momentarily. Momentarily. I've got a time word there myself, which is also a definite word. Certainly we will arrive at that. But here's the second reason why certainly isn't here. You don't, you don't have to turn shortly into certainly to have the idea of definite, definiteness here because you already have that in the word must, M-U-S-T. If, if we want to see something about determination, about certainty, about uh, God's unchangeable will or mind in this matter, you don't have to turn the word shortly into certainty. You already have a certainty word. What do you think must means? But must. Leave shortly alone and let it be a time word. And if you want a word for certainly, you want something that's concrete and that speaks of something definitely coming to pass, then what does must mean? But must. Must is a definite word. That this is definitely true. That it will definitely happen shortly. You've got a certainty word that's followed then by a time word. Uh, so let me say something about this word must. I want to concentrate on that for just a moment. I don't want to read over that too quickly. We'll incorporate our little study of this into our, our study, our larger, broader study of the term shortly. John says these are things which must shortly come to pass. Now, that is a word in Greek, a little small word in Greek, that denotes absolute necessity, such as in logic, 
or mathematics, such as in logic or mathematics. Such as in this phrase, 2 plus 2 must equal 4. There's something that's um, compelling and forceful and something that's determinate about that. Or this fact that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Would any of us question that at all? That's, there's, there's something about that that seems to be so definite that you could think and reason and calculate and figure until the cows come home. And you'd never change the certainty about that matter. You see, there are certain matters in logic and there are certain matters in mathematics that are definite, that nothing can change it. And, and the Greek would use this word must for them that the shortest distance between two points must be a short line, or that the, that the sum total of the parts of a whole equal the whole. We would all agree with that, right? That you could take a whole and divide it up into two parts or two trillion parts, but whenever you add them back together, what do you have? You've got the whole again. You never have anything more, never have anything less. Now, if somebody steals part of your pie and you try to put it back together, well, then, then you have a problem. But in mathematics, that doesn't happen. People don't eat math like you eat slices of pie. That's P-I-E, not P-I. It's another pie in math, too, I guess. There's something certain about that. that and that's a mathematical type certainty that you can't get around. You can be black or white, male or female, saved or unsaved. You can't get around that fact. That a whole equals the sum total of all of its parts, and that the sum total of all the parts of a whole equal the whole. You say, well, boy, I, I mean, I never, I never questioned that. That's the whole thing. You never question it. It's obvious, but it's still true, though. There's not even a shadow or possibility of it being false or erroneous, right? All right, that's what John is saying here about the events in this book. There's not even a shadow. You know how people kind of, mm, I don't know. This is well, they kind of question and and fudge on the, some of the contents of this book. You don't fudge on mathematics, not on the laws of math. You, you don't fudge on the laws of logic. You don't fudge on that at all. And the same type of word is being used here. Let me just give you a few other places where this is used in the New Testament. If you go over to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 16, and verse 21. Matthew 16 and verse 21 concerning, this is the first advent of Christ, and the Lord's death by crucifixion. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and die and be buried and be raised again. The whole episode of his passion and death and resurrection. And what did he say that he must? Why, why, why must? Well, our book that we're studying now, Revelation, tells us that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If you're slain from the foundation of the world, then, then how could you not be slain? That's, that's like saying 2 plus 2 equals 4, then probably that means that 4 equals 2 plus 2. You can turn it around either way you want to. You can put the 4 first, and the 2 plus 2 afterwards, or the 2 plus 2 first, and the 4 afterwards. You can put the plan of, of Jesus being crucified first and his crucified experience later, or you could reverse those, and you still have a must on your hands. This must happen. There was no perchance or perhaps or maybe about this crucifixion, about this death and burial, about this resurrection business. And about it being done somewhere in the uh, proximity of the city of Jerusalem. Of course, he suffered without the camp, the writer of Hebrews tells us, but he did some suffering in the camp. His final death was Hebrews 13 on the outside of the city of Jerusalem. You hardly could put somebody up on a cross down at 4th and Judah Avenue or whatever. <laughs> You're going to have to put them outside of the city. In chapter 24 and verse 6, Signs of the Lord's return. Jesus said these things must happen, but the end is not yet. Mark 8.31, Mark 9.11, Mark 13.7, Luke 21.9. How about what Jesus said in John 3, that a man must be born again if he wants to see the kingdom of heaven. 
If he wants to enter the kingdom of heaven, he must be born again. That's a certainty. That there's no way you'll see it, there's no way you'll enter it until you're born again, John 3. 1 Corinthians 11:19. Paul said there must be divisions among us so that we can know the approved ones. Paul said in Hebrews 11:6, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Or you can't come to God. You can't come to God not believing that he's God. I mean, there's some certainty and some logic involved here. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, that God truly exists, or you cannot come to God. And you've got it used here in the book of Revelation elsewhere. In chapter 4 and verse 1, things which must take place hereafter. Or over in chapter 22 and verse 6, He said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his slaves the things which must shortly be done. And you find the word in other places in the New Testament, but it's a very strong word that connotes absolute necessity as mathematical equations are certain. Certain mathematical equations, maybe not all the ones you tried to put together in school, but the ones in the back of the teacher's book. So there's no need to turn shortly into a certainly word. Shortly doesn't mean certainly in Greek, and we already have a certainly word there. It's the word must. These things must come to pass. Drop the word shortly for now so you don't get bogged down in chronology, but these things must occur. They must happen. They must take place. See, whenever things like that are said in the word, it's like, well, you can see behind it all God's determination, God's predetermination of these things, that history is just rushing toward a conclusion. Shortly, we're, we're to a time word. It's rushing toward a conclusion, but it's not on some road of its own. It hasn't devised its own schemes and ideas. God is the one who's behind it all. If God is not the one behind it all, directing, orchestrating all of the events of history, then perchance something could happen in there that would mess up the final plans of God, like of the return of Christ to overthrow the kingdoms of this world. Perhaps, you know, some kingdom could become a good kingdom so that at the end, Christ would return and rule jointly with the good kingdom, with the righteous kingdom over there. All the bad kingdoms are overthrown. Well, that would be an absurdity to even think of. Christ returns to rule alone. He's not going to share his rule with some worldly Gentile power out there that has done some righteous deeds, and so they become good. These things must come to pass. Nations don't devise their own ideas and plans. They think that they do. That's the whole mystery of God's predetermination and his predestination. God is the one who's behind it all. You know, that brings something to mind. I got a, a received in the mail this week one of the newsletters from one of these big faith charismatic organizations, you know, and they have, there's, there's one in Texas and one in Oklahoma and so forth, and they have a question and answer column in there. And I've just been waiting. I have actually just been waiting for them to deal with a certain issue. They deal with, you know, little funny, odd things in there. People write in questions, and, of course, they can't respond to all of them, so they do, you know, they pull a dear Abby on you. They pick one or two that they like out of there or that they think is um, uh, a sampling or representative of what other Christians might be questioning out there, and they deal with it publicly in a public forum of their magazine or their newsletter. And so here was the question. What is your opinion about the doctrine of predestination, which has God electing some to life and dooming other people? And, you know, written by Charismatic, I told you before, if there are two big areas where Pentecostals differ from the Word of God and from us, it's concerning the issue of women and their roles in the church. Pentecostals just almost... Uh, to the man are in favor of women preaching, teaching, pastoring, and everything else. And the other area is Arminianism when it comes to areas like predestination. Well, he went right down there and said, well, now, we believe John 3, 16, God so loved the world, and the Bible says, even the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 30, that the choice of blessing and cursing is yours. You choose between life and death. Notice that use of Scripture there? Nice use of Scripture and that it would be unjust of God and unfair, and it does not square with the rest of the Scripture's teaching. 
And so they get you into Romans chapter 8, which talks about the fact that God, whom he has foreknown, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Well, foreknew means that God looked down through history and knew who would accept Christ, quote unquote, when they heard the gospel call and God predestinated them to salvation, which is another way of saying that a man can create his own new heart, that a man can create his own election and calling. You just do it yourself. Whenever you do it, then God looks down through history and he does it after you've done it, which means he doesn't choose us, we choose him, right? It's contrary to all the rest of the biblical revelation. And I like the fact that, well, I like it, quote, unquote, I didn't like the fact, makes me angry, biblically angry, that they gave a little bit from Romans 8, didn't dare skip over next door, though, to Romans 9. <laughs> yeah, I found that very interesting. They knocked on Romans 8 door, but they wouldn't dare go over there to Romans chapter 9. What are you going to do with that? The children being not yet born, neither having done good or evil, that neither having done good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Not of him that wills or of him that runs, but of God that showeth mercy. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. The scripture saith unto Pharaoh, and you know, you can go through the whole chapter there. For this same purpose I raise you up, that I could show my power in you, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So God has mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. That's right in the next chapter. They, the end of their answer just boom, 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 dealt with several verses in Romans chapter 8. God's on our side, and he foreknew you in the sense that he knew the choices that you would make, and he predestinated you on that basis. For the continuation of this message, please turn the... He knew you in the sense that he knew the choices that you would make, and he predestinated you on that basis. And right next door to that chapter they were using, I mean, I would have trying to hide somewhere back in Zephaniah or something. Because right next door is Romans 9. Romans 9. God will have mercy, he said, unto Moses I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have pity on whom I will have pity. So then it's not of him that willeth. There's your old free will business there. It's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. He shows mercy on whom he will show mercy, and whom he will, he harden it. Nay, but a man will reply, well, then why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? Paul knew what people would say. Well, that just doesn't make sense there. And Paul said, have you ever watched a potter? He has power over the clay. Well, wait a minute. Now, you're saying that human vessels are nothing but clay, and God just violates them, and well, no one said violates, but that's what the Bible teaches, that God is a potter and that the human race is a clay and he has power to make one vessel to honor and another vessel unto dishonor. You, but you see, there are certain ways in which they phrase it. They're totally ignorant of, of, of the depths of the argument and of the depths of the doctrine that they're even involved in trying to answer that. They don't realize what they just said. Whenever you, deny predest whenever you deny this must word here, that, well, everything is just kind of happening the way it's supposed to, or at least in salvation, it's happening the way as man decides for it to happen. Because if that's not true, then that means that no man's free, and then how can God blame man for his sins? Well, Paul said, who are you to reply against God? Amen. That was Paul's answer, who are we to reply against God? But they showed how ignorant they were of this whole matter by using words like this, that it, the, it's totally contrary to the revelation of the whole Bible, both Old and New Testaments, for God to randomly, they use that word, randomly. We never claim. The Calvinists never claim. God doesn't just randomly pick, like whenever you go into Baskin Robbins and you just kind of randomly pick things there. God picked things with perfect choice, with perfect purpose behind them. He picked some and he's got a purpose. He didn't just randomly pick some people out there. Calvinists have never taught that. He chose certain people because he wanted to, and he's got reasons why he chose them. That's not random selection there. That's election. You elect something. I mean, whenever you're wanting a new pet, you don't just go to the Humane Society and say, you got anything around here? I'll take anything you have here. You probably go in there, or however you go about getting your pets, you go in there and elect the ones you want. Elect the ones you want to bestow your love and your kindness and your favor upon. You go in there and elect certain ones. You don't just say, I'll take any animal. 
Well, I say, well, what do you want here? We've got a runaway giraffe. We've got an elephant. We've got some dogs, some cats, some white mice. What is it that you want here? Just randomly, just pick anything out of there. That's not how we pick. That's not how God picks. God picks with perfect purpose behind his choices. Well, they thought they could throw that word in, you know, randomly to shame those of us who believe what Paul taught in Ephesians 1 and in Romans 9, 10, and 11, the doctrine of predestination. Oh, you people just believe that God randomly picks. No, we believe that he picked me, us, with a purpose. And if he didn't pick you, he's got a purpose. Maybe it's your prideful mind and your bragging heart is why he didn't pick you. That may be, that'd be one good reason why. He knew if he ever got you anywhere near his side, you'd boast about the whole matter all the day long. Having never read, evidently, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it's all by grace. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. Well, I guess that's somewhat of an aside, but I've just been waiting. I knew that question was going to get brought up sooner or later. I've had to deal with it in, well, in charismatic uh, group and church and institution situations where to the man... They are Arminians. To the man, they are free willers and not predestinarians, which is the old term, predestinarians. Paul said we've been predestinated unto the adoption of grace as God's sons. We've been predestinated to that. But predestination to them means that God saw that you would choose him and then he chose you. Well, that's just that big old fat, jelly belly Santa Claus type of approach to Christianity, that God's yeah, he's pretty much nothing, that we run the world, that we control the world. What I'm trying to show you here from Revelation 1 and verse 1 with this term must here is that these are things that must come about. Now, I'm not saying that the leaders over in Europe today or that Antichrist in the last day is going to sit down and say, you know what, I've got to fulfill prophecy here. Let's see, it's over here in this chapter. It said I would rise up out of the sea. I would have seven heads and ten horns. Let's start getting those heads and horns manufactured now. He's going to be fulfilling all that, and the nations of the world are fulfilling those things, totally oblivious to what the biblical revelation is. They're, they're not aware of that at all. The nations in the last days, they begin to get together and do whatever their maneuvers are, and this group is going to come against that group, and they're not going to be even under the uh, suspicion, let alone the conviction, that, hey, we're, filling, we're fulfilling biblical prophecy here. And that's what's amaz so amazing about it all, that it's all going to work out to a T. Amen. We say to a T, just a figure of speech, it's all going to work out like that because these things must come to pass. They're not going to say, you know what, there's this nice little valley over in Israel called the Valley of Megiddo. I think we ought to gather there for our next big important battle. I mean, why, ba why gather there? Why not gather in the plains of South Dakota? or the plains of the Soviet Union or something. Why do you want to gather down there in this little valley stuck away in the land of Israel? Why do you want to gather down there? They're going to gather there, though. The Bible says they are under the influence of deceiving spirits that come out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. They're going to go and gather the nations together to come to the battle of God in the valley of the mountain of Megiddo, the Armageddon battle. How are they going to know that? They're not going to. They're going to do it anyway, though. These things must come to pass. So, anyway, the third view really doesn't hold any water because that's not what John says. It's not what the Greek says in the term shortly. So we have a fourth view, and this is probably one of the most attractive views, trying to make sense of these things must shortly come to pass. And that tells us that shortly should be understood like hastily or quickly that once these series of events begin whenever that is there's no comment as to when they'll begin here in this text they would tell us that once these series of events begin they will swiftly or rapidly or hastily run their course see it it would mean one thing for you to say i'm shortly going to the store and I'm swiftly going to the store, right? Shortly means from the time you've just said that, uh, very soon thereafter, you're going to be going to the store. I will swiftly go to the store. That doesn't tell us when you're going to go. Maybe you're going to go two years from now, right? But it just tells us that when you go, you're going to do it fast. All right, so that's, this is a real interesting theory here to try to 
uh, relieve ourselves of an embarrassing situation. And that is that John said shortly, and now 1,900 years have gone by. Well, pretty interesting theory, I would say. A lot of people have accepted that. Obviously, you can tell I'm not buying into that. I would if I thought it were right, but I don't believe that it is. It's a nice way to get around an embarrassing situation of keeping the reputation of the prophet John untarnished. He said shortly. Maybe he didn't mean shortly like it was going to happen soon after he spoke these words. Maybe he meant it was going to happen swiftly. That is, whenever it began to happen, these events from chapters 4 on or whatever are going to run their course rapidly. Well, even that, uh, what do you mean by rapidly? If we believe in a seven-year tribulation period, we've got at least seven years we're dealing with. I don't know that seven years is rapidly. Depends on what you mean by rapidly, I guess. Rapidly in view of the eons of time. Rapidly the way most of us would think of it when we hear the term. What if someone told you whenever they got around to do, doing something, they'd do it rapidly, and it took them seven years? You would say, hey, I didn't get what I bargained for. That wasn't done rapidly at all. Seven years may, from, from some perspectives, be a long period of time. So we're told that no comment is given as to when these events will start, just that when they do start, they'll be over with quickly. Well, the Greek will allow this. Now, to be fair to this view, the Greek word will allow that. The word can mean rapidly in that sense. The Greek will allow that, but the context won't. <laughs> we'll see what that context is in a moment. It's down in the third verse. We have to stay with all of Scripture. The Greek would allow that. I'm willing to believe that, but I'm not when I read the rest of the Bible, though. And hey, I, I of all people, would like to keep the reputation of the prophet John untarnished. I don't want him to be a false prophet. Well, he's not. He's true. But he didn't mean that, well, I'm not commenting on to as to when these things will happen, but when they begin, they'll run their course swiftly. Because even that's partially untrue, that they'll run their course swiftly. It's going to take a period of several years. And if he said things which must shortly come to pass, add on the millennium to that seven-year period, then you've got a thousand and seven years. These things, would, I, I would assume, would mean the book of Revelation, all of the book of Revelation. These things will shortly come to pass. That's a thousand and seven years. I don't think that's rapidly in anybody's book except maybe God's, which is one thing that they try to do. They say, well, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So all he's saying is from God's point of view, these things will shortly come about. Well, in a sense, that's true. In a sense, it's not. That doesn't really help the readers of Revelation, though. They were probably under the idea that John said these things will shortly come to pass, assuming that all the other biblical signs and uh, criteria are met. So let's come to a fifth view, then. I think it's a biblical view. First of all, just a word or two, very briefly. I know I'm going rather quickly tonight. I'm trying to run my course rapidly. So that we can shortly do something else. But just a word or two about the Greek here then. I won't give you too much because there are several different words that are used. The, the phrase here is in take, T-A-C-H-E-I. It comes from the word takos, T-A-C-H-O-S. There's a related word, taku, T-A-C-H-U, there's several, and there's other words that I don't plan on giving you, but there are several words, takos, take, taku, all of which mean basically the same thing, shortly. A few references, we won't look all these up, we'll look one or two up here in a moment. Luke 18, 8, takos, that's the word from which this phrase, in take, is taken in Revelation 1, 1. But takos appears in Luke 18.8, Acts 12.7, Acts 22.18, Acts 25.4, Romans 16.20. Remember Paul there to the Roman Christians said that God will shortly crush Satan under your feet? Well, shortly. Well, he, he could have had double application, but crush, to me, that's, that's the end times there. 
So we have a verse kind of like Revelation 1.1. Paul told the Roman Christians that God will shortly crush the devil. That He won't really be crushed until Revelation chapter 20. Of course, that could have had a temporary fulfillment with them as well at that time. Then, of course, here in Revelation 1.1, takos is used, and also in Revelation 22.6. But then there's another word that's just, it's in the same family, and that's the word taku, T-A-C-H-U, and that appears a whole lot in Revelation. Like in Revelation 22, 7, they're, they're virtually synonyms of one another. One appears in 22, 6, and another one in 22, 7. So what do all of these words mean? Well, they mean swiftly, quickly, Shortly, soon, depending on the context, but for the most part, the words mean just what it's translated here in Revelation 1.1 is shortly, shortly. For instance, in chapter 2 here of Revelation, now this isn't the word takos of 1.1, but it's the relative term taku in revelation chapter 2 and verse 5 what do you think this means here do you think that jesus is or is not commenting on the soonness of this thread here remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else i will come unto thee quickly taku and will remove thy lampstand out of his place except thou repent now is that like the fourth interpretation of the phrase in revelation 1 1 that i gave you here earlier where jesus is not commenting as to how long it'll be until he comes and removes your lampstand just that whenever he comes whenever that is then the removing of the lampstand will take place in a very short period of time see no we would not normally think of that as we read the verse we would think that He's threatening to remove their lampstand shortly, quickly, hastily. That means soon after he says this, if they don't repent. We wouldn't think, now he's talking about 2,000 years later. We think that means shortly. Well, of course, it does. In verse 16, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly. He's not talking about how fast he'll get there once he starts coming. He means he's coming now if you don't repent. In chapter 3, in verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. And in chapter 11, 14, and over in chapter 22, verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. In verse 12, I come quickly. In verse 20, I come quickly. And so then we're left back with Revelation 1, 1. These are things which must quickly come to pass, or shortly. Either word would be fine. They mean the same thing. So there's the language now. How about an interpretation of that word then? Well, I think the simplest biblical answer is not the preterist theory, number one that I gave you. It's not the fourth view that we've just covered, but it's this view that we have to keep in mind. John is a prophet. He is writing prophecy, and he's writing from an eschatological point of view. This is true elsewhere in the Old Testament, and it becomes that much more true in the New, and especially in the book of Revelation, that in the prophet's writings, whether it's Isaiah or Ezekiel or Daniel or Jesus, who was a prophet, or Paul, who was a prophet, or here John, in eschatology, in prophetic matters, in matters concerning the day of the Lord, the events that immediately precede and follow Jesus' return to the earth. The end, the E-N-D, the end, is often telescoped so that any intervening years are overlooked, if there are any intervening years. And you won't know until those intervening years intervene. Now see that right away, if you're thinking, that brings up all types of different questions. And well, what about imminency of... The Lord's return. What about signs that precede his coming? 
What about questions that we have like this? Well, can we know that we're living in the last days? Who can know that? Have other people said that and been wrong? Then what gives us the right to say that we can say that we know that we're living in the last days? That brings up all types of questions about the chronology of the day of the Lord and of end time events. John is a prophet, and I'm saying when you write prophecy like John does often, the end in view is telescope. You know what that means. You look through a telescope, and what is really way, way out there appears to be a lot shorter. And whatever's between you and that, if you've got a telescope, like you've probably all looked through, and you've seen the stars or the moon, or whatever's between you and that, namely all of this space, is um, kind of cut out. A lot of it's just cut out. And all of a sudden you see something nearer than it really is. That's what John means whenever he says this. John, John is not saying that he definitely knows or he'd be a false prophet that these events will happen in the next five or six or seven years because they didn't happen unless you believe the preterist view. And if you don't believe the preterist view, well... If you believe the preterist view and you really hold it consistently, you make John out to be a false prophet because the things John envisioned did not come about. If you don't hold the preterist view, you still make John out to be a false prophet unless you deal with this term shortly in some other way. So John writing as a prophet telescopes the future and the intervening period of time, John, unless he's got some revelation that we don't know that he had, John doesn't know how long that will be. He just knows that it'll be shortly because that's what the Bible says. Shortly, these things will come about. Jesus had told John himself, John's probably writing, well, definitely he's writing Revelation after he got the Revelation. And what did the Lord say to him? Behold, I come quickly. So he's not going to contradict the words of Jesus. Jesus himself said, behold, I come shortly. It's the same word in the Greek. Behold, I come shortly. So if Jesus is coming shortly, surely anything that leads up to his coming will come shortly also. You see, we're really, if we don't like the term there, we're really finding fault with the Lord Jesus who gave John the term himself and not John. John is just quoting what Jesus said. Jesus said, I come quickly. Obviously, the things that precede his coming must come quickly or shortly as well. But you say, but wait a minute, it's been 1,900 years, but you've got to always remember this. That's what the skeptics and the critics always say. You've got to remember this. They didn't know that when John said it. It'd be another matter if they knew it and then practiced knowingly deception on people or they were involved in some hallucination here where they kind of knew it was, but then they didn't know whether it really was or not. They didn't know 1,900 years would intervene. 1900 years at least and perhaps more they didn't know that so another question comes up you might ask me then well did john feel that he was living in the last days yes he said that he was in first john 2 little children it is the last time all right so john all right did john expect to see the lord's return during his lifetime well we're getting into some interesting questions then did John expect to see that? Let me say it to you like this. If John did expect to, his expectations had to be based on something that was scriptural. Or you just, it's not an expectation, it's just a wish. Your expectations have to be based on some reason for them, right? You have to have some reason. I've got a reason I'm expecting the Lord to or not to come or not come, do this or not do this. Your expectations would have to be based upon something. Well, we're going to be getting more into that. Turn over to Luke chapter 18, though. Let me just show you where the Lord himself has used this word. I've already showed you he's used it in the book of Revelation. But in Luke chapter 18, we, we kind of have like this, this parable situation of a judge that didn't fear God or man and because this woman pestered him so much, then finally he said, well, I want to avenge this woman, so she'll leave me alone. And then Jesus goes on to give the interpretation in verses 6 and following. And you probably would already know, you've read the passage, you could already guess, speculate yourself, the interpretation, all right, somehow the judge equals God. Now, God's not unjust. 
So there are only parts of that illustration that carry over and that are applicable to God. This was an unjust judge. And, of course, God ends up being the judge in the story, doesn't he? Well, he's not unjust. It's only part of that. What carries over is the fact that he is judge, that his word is final. That's the only part that carries over into the interpretation. And the widow would be the believer and crying night and day and uh, this avenging me. Well, that would speak of persecution. You know, when's God going to avenge his elect? When is he going to rectify the injustice that exists in this world? When is truth going to triumph? When will that happen? Well, let's listen to the Lord's answer. The Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. Go back and read what the unjust judge sa said. I will avenge her, middle of verse 5. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. That's the same word, shortly, soon, however you want to translate it. It's the same word as we find over in the book of Revelation. I tell you, he will avenge them. Has God avenged his elect yet? Not yet. 1,900 years plus have gone by. 1,900 years. We fought John. We have to fault Jesus and other biblical writers who would use the same word and the same concept and the same terminology. He said, I will avenge them speedily. He didn't mean that whenever he began the process of avenging, it would run its course rapidly. He means he will do it shortly. And yet, this is something that you just have to keep in mind. And, and you say, well, why did God do it this way? Before I answer that, look at the end of verse 8. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, obviously it's a reference to the second advent. When will God avenge his elect? At the second advent. Any avenging up until then is just temporary. You know that. Every now and then he lets you triumph over your enemy, which is good. He puts your enemy down and he gets fired or gets a black eye and you who are just patient and kind and meek, you get the raise or whatever, he avenges you. But then somebody else crushes your head the next day. There's another persecution. There's another trial to go through. Any avenging that you have is, is, is a blessing and, and God promises that in the here and the now in this life. But the ultimate, the absolute avenging of his elect, that won't happen until the second advent. That's what he's talking about. That's the context here. So you could ask me, well, what, does, what purpose does all of this serve for God to keep saying, well, he will avenge us speedily, or John to say, these are things which must shortly come to pass? Well, you probably already guess the basic major reason idea behind it all. God's not trying to deceive us and trick us into slothfulness or into slumber. Just the reverse. He's trying to encourage us to watchfulness. He's trying to encourage us to watchfulness. He said in the end of Mark chapter 13, and what I say to you, I say to all, watch. W-A-T-C-H. What if the Lord had just kind of thrown in here, and there are some verses, we're going to deal with those later on. Matthew 25, parable of the ten virgins. When the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. But those are relatively few. But they're there and they're important. They give us another hint and a balance in another direction. But what if the Bible is filled with these ideas? It's going to be many, 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 many years before the Lord returns. Now, we would like to say, well, any true Christian would still never use that as an excuse to sin. Well, we would like to say that, but we know how human nature and how the flesh really are, though. The Lord's not going to return for many, many, many years. I might live to be... Well, at least 40 or 50 or maybe 70 or 80. Got a lot of time. Can sin a lot, repent a lot. Sin a lot, repent a lot. The Bible says he'll come shortly. And that kind of keeps you awake and keeps you watching then. And you can't ever go back in your mind and say, well, they thought it was shortly and it's been 1,900 years. Because what the Bible teaches is as soon as you get people so convinced of that, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Then he'll come. Because he's going to catch them unawares, remember the Bible says, as a thief in the night. It, there's going to get to the point, and we're about there now with a lot of people in the world who look back on that with a skeptical, critical mind. It's been 1,900 years. They said shortly. Somebody said shortly 500 years ago. Then what are we doing still saying shortly? I'm saying this. It's shorter than when we began. That's what Paul argues in Romans chapter 13. Now is our salvation nearer than when we be believed. Hallelujah. 
something is happening here, whether it happens before we die or after we die, we're getting closer to it. We're getting closer. The Bible presents this, comes at it from different angles. Of course, people still want to know the final answer. Will I be alive when it all happens? Well, you may or you may not be. That's not the most important question, though. The most important question is, will you be ready either when it happens or when you die? That's the most important question there. The Bible deals with chronology plenty, but it deals with the other side as well. Remember over in Luke's gospel, whenever they, uh, Jesus began giving them some signs about the last days and about Noah's day and about he's going to two be in one bed and one take and another left and two down and grinding with a millstone and one take and another left. He says right in the middle of all that, but first the Son of Man must suffer many things and be crucified and buried and raised again. In other words, the idea kind of there is, yes, things are going to happen. There are many things in the future, but don't overlook what's the closest to you and what's the most important as far as near things are concerned. How can any of that be fulfilled? The second advent without the purpose of the first advent, he came to bear away sins, Hebrews 9, 27, without the purpose of the first advent being fulfilled. We look for him the second time apart from sin because he came to bear sin the first time. Well, I want to take you finally in this little discussion of Revelation 1.1 back to Revelation 1 now in verse 3. I told you under the fourth theory that quickly these things are things which must quickly or hastily come to pass in the sense of, you know, running their course. It could be translated that way. But I said the context won't allow it. And where is that? That's in the end of verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. Now we don't have to wonder about shortly and quickly. Does that mean it's going to happen soon after John said it or does that mean that whenever it happens it's going to run its course swiftly? We don't have to be concerned about that because it's given to us in another uh, phrase now. For the time is at hand. The time is at hand. Now, does that sound like, well, what that really means is whenever it begins, then it will be at hand. No. You obviously know what shortly means. Verse 3 would interpret verse 1 for you. Shortly means it's at hand. It's like James said in James chapter 5, the judge is even at the door. At hand would mean at the door. It would be the same as at the door. The judge is even at the door. Hey, there's another reference right there, James 5, another prophet, another biblical writer who has this telescoping view of prophecy. This message will be continued on the following tape.